Hey everyone, we're back. As you know, Facebook, all types of challenges sometimes. When you want to level up your program, sometimes there are all types of content challenges that prevent it from having a smooth show, but we're back. We're not gonna let anything stop us. Uh, we were talking before uh, the video got cut off is that you know every single Monday, what we do is we come to you and we talk about infidelity recovery. There's so many of you who have been through trials and tribulations in your relationship and you're just trying to figure out how can you overcome, how can you get past your challenges to have the relationship that you ultimately want to have. And so what we're going to do tonight is talk about an amazing topic that I really think will be a blessing to you. Uh, and that is, you know, your spouse has cheated. Where's the remorse? But before we do that, you know, Couples Academy has a Facebook group uh, on, on Facebook. And the name of that group is The Audacity of Marriage. And every single month, we celebrate couples who have just uh, experienced an anniversary. And so if you're not a part of that group, I would highly recommend that you do that. But there are three couples, uh, as we start out the beginning of April, who have uh, relationships that are being celebrated, and we just want to honor them. And so first up, we have a, an amazing couple here. This is Paul and Priscilla. Now, they've known each other for 11 uh, years, I believe, but they've only been married for five and so we want to honor them for their particular relationship. Next, we have another amazing couple. This couple goes by the name of Matthew and Char. They've been married for 22 years. And they have an amazing family with amazing kids. And we just celebrate them on tonight. And our last couple, they're new to our tribe. Uh, we have David and June. They've been together for 33 long years. And I just think it's important that we take the time to honor couples who have stuck in there. Couples who have experienced trials and situations and even tribulations in their relationship, but beyond the storms, beyond the bad weather, they saw a light breaking through the clouds and said, we're going to stick this thing out. And they've had wonderful relationships and many people have gleaned from their wisdom, gleaned from their awesomeness, and we just want to celebrate them today. So if you are not a part of that group, I highly recommend that you join the Audacity of Marriage because we have a lot of great content in that particular group that can be a blessing to your relationship. Now, remember, whether you're dating in a committed courtship, engaged, or married, uh, that particular group is for you because it's going to give you the how-to of a successful relationship. Now, we're talking about my spouse cheated. Uh, where is the remorse? Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time with this, but I just wanted to give you some things to begin to digest and to think about. If you've been in a relationship and your spouse has been unfaithful, many of us would assume that the natural response, once the spouse has been discovered, that there would be an immediate amount of remorse, uh, that he or she would come begging and pleading with flowers and candy, and they would be groveling uh, for forgiveness and doing whatever they could to restore that relationship. But we're finding that there are so many couples who do not have that experience. In fact, they're shocked and amazed at how unapologetic, unremorseful their spouse actually is. Interestingly enough, if they are remorseful, uh, they show more remorse about being caught than about the deed or the action that they participated in. And so statistically, it, it, it has been said that within the first year after discovering the affair, it is very common for the spouse to not be remorseful. However, as you transition beyond that first year into the second year, usually that's when that spouse becomes apologetic. They have a new perspective. They realize the damage that they have caused, and they're willing to do what they can to restore the relationship. Now, does that mean that you have to wait an entire year? Absolutely not. Now, these are statistics. It doesn't speak to all relationships, but it does share what is very common. And as unfair as it is, the recovery process is very unfair because the hurt partner is often responsible for doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Like all of the emotional drama that they're going through, oftentimes they feel like they're going through this all by themselves and they don't have a willing participant to help them through. Now, what's interesting is that we have found couples uh, who are going through crisis, when a partner is unfaithful, a lot of the times it has everything to do with the fact that they are still in some way connected to the affair partner. And so we have a no contact contract the, that we encourage both partners within a relationship to sign 
as we take them through the recovery process. Because if they're still connected in any way with that affair partner, it's very easy for them to become demotivated and their thoughts and their emotions become very confused. And then all of a sudden they're vacillating back and forth. Should I stay? Should I go? Is this situation that I am better than the one I have at home? And so they're caught up in all of this emotional turmoil because they're still connected. And so we encourage a complete disconnect of all types of interactions. That is through phone, through text, through social media, through email, even through social environments that you engage together. And what's interesting is that I have met a lot of couples and work with a lot of couples where the affair has taken place on someone's job. So after the affair is over and they're ready to reconcile, there's a whole lot of insecurity in the spouse, the, un, you know, the hurt spouse, because their partner is entering into an environment where they're working with the person that they cheated with every single day. Uh, possibly their cubicles are next to each other. Possibly they're in the same department, if not the same department, the same building. Or maybe it's not a work situation, but you serve in ministry together. You belong to the same church or the same social club. You go to the same gym. In essence, you're going to a place where you're constantly frequenting that particular person. And that creates a huge vulnerability. Now, if the uh, unfaithful partner has a glimpse, has an interaction, has continual conversation with the person that they were involved in an affair with, those emotions are still there. And it's hard to break free. So when people say, yes, you know, we were in an affair, but, you know, we've ended it and everything's all good and we're friends now. Listen, I don't forget affairs for a second. If you're in a regular relationship and the relationship has been incorporated with sexual uh, activity and you break up today, it's hard to just go and transition into being friends because you've gone beyond the point of basic friendship. You've begun to explore a level of intimacy, emotional and sexual, that takes you beyond the friend mode or friend zone. So just simply transitioning back uh, and having the nature of a friend is impossible, particularly when it's an affair relationship. So the relationship has to end. So listen, if you go to the same church, it may be time to relocate and find a new church home. If you work on the same job, it may be time to get a transfer and go somewhere else. You know, if you belong to the same organization or serve on the same committee, whatever the case, you've got to remove yourself from that environment for your own sake and for the sake of your relationship. And we find that individuals who don't make that hard break uh, really prolong the feelings. Now, here's an interesting statistic. I may have shared this with you before. Let's just say you have an old high school sweetheart. You haven't seen them in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years. And then you reconnect on social media. Statistics say after about a few minutes of communicating with each other, catching up, tell me what's going on, how you're doing, and you're reconnecting and you're sharing your life experiences. The same feeling and emotion that you once had can possibly trigger back up because your emotions have a memory. And it is nothing for those emotions to flood your mind and to rush throughout the course of your body. And you're at that spot where all of a sudden you feel feelings that have been rekindled because of that reconnection. Now, statistics also suggest that after 30 days of communication, there is a high probability that an affair will occur. So oftentimes that relationship that started online transitions offline. And now you're having conversations and now you're meeting for coffee and now you're meeting at the hotel, the motel, the Holiday Inn, uh, just to slip back at home, uh, not noticed, uh, hopefully undiscovered. But that typically doesn't last too long because eventually it all comes out. So it is very, very, very um, vulnerable. You're placing your relationship in a vulnerable state when you begin to engage in inappropriate interactions with members of the opposite sex. So we have uh, began to you know, do some research as well as talk to many of our clients to figure out why. Why is it if you have violated the relationship, if you have almost caused it to be destroyed, are you not sorrowful? Are you not remorseful? Why is it that you don't care? I'm the one as the hurt partner who's crying and weeping and tearing and you see me going through my struggle, but it seems like there's no type of compassion that you give me. And so what I want to do is quickly go over the seven reasons why your partner uh, may not have remorse in what to do with it, okay? So I put a list together that I wanted to share with you. Number one, uh, 
they did not know that they were cheating. Now, as weird and as crazy as that may seem or sound, if there wasn't a physical or sexual interaction, let's just say it was just emotional. A lot of times when we begin to form relationships with members of the opposite sex, our partner and I, the spouses, have not established clear lines of distinction. We haven't established proper boundaries or borders in the relationship to determine what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And so it's very easy as you're spending the course of your day at work or serving in ministry or wherever you may meet somebody, engaged in conversation, that that natural, normal, quote unquote, platonic interaction can become inappropriate because you start talking about basic affairs of life, politics, music, work, society, and then the more you begin to talk, the more you become more intimate. Why? Because intimacy is the foundation of all communication. So the more you're engaging in communication, the more intimate your conversations uh, begin. So you begin starting off uh, dealing with general facts and then they become very personal facts and then you start sharing your opinions and your feelings and your thoughts on things and then all of a sudden there's an emotional connection that takes place. Because guess what? We just have a chemistry. We just have a connection and wow, this is so new, this is so fresh. I remember when we used to have it, you know, when I first started dating my wife or my husband and that has passed a long time ago and to be able to talk to somebody who truly understands me. See, that's how it all begins. And so oftentimes we're caught up in an emotional affair and may not have realized that we're doing it or when we get to the point where we really do realize that, you know what, there's a feeling, there's something unique and different. You know what, I do have an attraction. We try to figure out how far or how close to the line we can get without crossing it. By that point, we've already crossed the line. And so now we're hiding our interactions and our conversations from the partner. Now we've never really defined what is considered an affair. So we justify and legitimize our actions. And that's what we typically do. And so that's why I think it's important that couples have a working operational definition for things that are important to the relationship. So we need to discuss what is an affair? What is infidelity? What is unfaithfulness? What is considered inappropriate behavior when dealing with members of the opposite sex? Now, until you do that, then it's going to be quite unclear and somewhat confusing for a partner who's slipping into areas that would be deemed inappropriate uh, or create a vulnerability in the relationship. Number two, they engage in an exit affair uh, and they're using it to get out of the relationship. So think about it. A couple who's been together for, say, two years, 10 years, 20 years, and one of them is just done. Like they're done. Like they're physically there, but they've left a long time ago. They've made an emotional departure years ago. So now uh, they've become cold and callous and don't care anymore and will do anything that they want to because they have no emotional connection or tie to the person they're in a relationship with. And oftentimes will use the affair as a justification to get out or because they're, they've made the decision to get out, they'll use the affair as a justification. So meaning, you know what, it was over anyway. And it's not like we were moving towards reconciliation. We were one step from divorce, so I cheated. So therefore, if I can justify that in my mind, why would I be remorseful for something like that? This is the psychology and the pathology of an individual who has been unfaithful and the reason why they may not be showing any type of remorse. Number three, uh, the cheater has a huge, a gr huge grievances towards their spouse. So they have deeply embedded anger. So if I'm cheating because... I'm just mad and I'm angry and I'm frustrated and I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and I can't take this anymore and now I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to stick it to you. I'm going to make you feel what I've been feeling for all these years. I may react by indulging in an affair. So now I have all of the rationalizations in my mind that justify my behavior. So once I'm exposed, I'm not remorseful because I did it because of X, Y, Z. And if you were doing ABC, then I wouldn't have did X, Y, Z. And so now we're throwing it back on the hurt spouse as to the reason why we cheated. And so that becomes their reasoning. And so therefore, it's very hard to feel remorseful in that type of situation. Uh, number four, the affair is still going on. And they are still in some, they're basically on the fence about whether they should stay, whether they should go. They're on the fence about the affair, about the marriage, and about you. We just covered this that if you're still in communication, it's hard to have any type of remorse because you're still connected. And a person who goes through the motions of counseling, I've dealt with couples who 
Both partners show up every single week. They do the homework. They have the conversations. But one's secretly still in the affair. And we're wondering why we're not moving forward and progressing to the, you know, at the rate that we thought we should is because there were still ties that that person had to another person. They were living a lie, they were living in secrecy, and their spouse uh, was not aware of it. And so that's why it is hard for that type of person to have remorse because they still have feelings and emotions for that other person. Number six, it's a sign of self-preservation and a massive denial of truth. So there's a phenomenal book um, that talks that I have, I think it's called Steering Clear. And it talks about the slippery slope of justifications and rationalizations that people have when uh, they are in affairs. And so it's a sign of self-preservation. Like, I listen, I've justified my belief in my position. And you know what? I'm not going to show remorse because I believe that I'm correct in my position. And fine, I did wrong. Oh, well, get over it. Let's move on. The relationship could get better if you get yourself together. But that's the reason why I did it. And they're not remorseful. And last but not least, number seven, and this is a doozy, showing remorse keeps the issue alive. And so the cheater or the unfaithful spouse, uh, they rather it just go away and you as a couple move forward than dealing with the pain that they have created. Isn't that interesting? So... They're not willing to show remorse because, or they know they feel remorse, but they're not willing to apologize. It, it, it's, it's almost like in the age of Trump, <laughs> I kind of understand that because this is an individual who makes mistakes and will not admit any wrongdoing whatsoever, will not apologize. Don't you know that there are people who are wired that way, that even when they know they're wrong, they can't muster up the words to say, I'm sorry. I apologize. I was wrong. Because if I do that, then we're forced to deal with the issue. And I just want this thing to go away. And I don't want to deal with the hurt and pain that I caused. I don't want to deal with shame. I don't want to deal with guilt. I just want to move forward. And what's interesting, usually the unfaithful partner has the least tolerance for pain. They don't mind the pain that they've caused the hurt partner. They don't mind the months or years of agony that that person goes through. But they don't want to be put in an uncomfortable situation and be forced to deal with what they've done. So they have a low threshold or low tolerance for pain. And even though when they know when they're wrong, they're not willing to admit it because by admitting it, they're forced to deal with those particular issues. These are some of the reasons why people are not remorseful. And if you're dealing with this type of individual in your relationship, I just want to let you know, if you have a desire to fight, if you have a desire to remain within that relationship, this is just a season. We talked about how in the first year, it's typically like this because there's a, I guess you could say, uh, when a person's grieving because of a loss that they've experienced, well, the unfaithful partner grieves as well. They're grieving the loss of the affair relationship. So there's a period where they're still thinking and fantasizing about that person. And then over the course of time, studies have proven after three months of being disconnected from the affair partner, all of a sudden they start thinking rationally. They start uh, connecting feelings toward their spouse again and realizing the error of their ways. So I, generally speaking, don't believe that term, time heals all wounds. I really don't because I know people who've gotten better over time and people who have gotten worse over time. It wasn't time that did it, but what they did with that time. But in this particular case, if the relationship has been severed in terms of the connection that the unfaithful partner has with the affair partner long enough all of a sudden, it seems like they wake up from their stupor, they no longer have a reprobate mind, and they begin to feel again. They begin to think rationally again. And so if you're going through a season right now where your spouse is not remorseful, they are not apologetic, they are not sorrowful for their actions, just know that it is a season that will pass. And so I encourage you to be patient. I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to focus on getting yourself together. Unfortunately, it's unfair because you're forced to pick up all the pieces by yourself and to heal. But until he or she realizes the error of his or her ways, they're not going to be any type of aid in your particular healing. But if you continue to pray that God will work on their heart, if you continue to be who you need to be to go through your healing process, right, and allow God to heal you and deal with your emotions and work on you, Prayerfully, in time, that other person will get on board as you two transition into your restoration process. Let me just say, in order for you to restore, 
one of the major pillars of restoration is remorsefulness. Once that person feels a sense of remorse, then you can transition. Now, if you're alone and by yourself, and it seems like things are just getting worse, or you're at a standstill and you can't seem to move forward, the next logical step would be to seek professional advice. Why? Because in your best of intentions, oftentimes they say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So by seeking the help of an expert, a professional who can guide you through the process of recovery, someone who can give you and your spouse a sense of awareness, it will help in your transition process. So what we do here at Couples Academy, as you can see, we're focused on what? Infidelity recovery and divorce prevention. So if you're going through something right now, I would highly encourage you to reach out to us. Go to our website, couplesacademy.org, right? Set up a 30-minute free counseling session, a discovery call, just to figure out what path you need to take and let us begin to do the work together. We have worked with hundreds of couples all throughout the United States and the world and have gotten tremendous results. So I don't want you to give up hope. Even though the future looks bleak, you don't know what tomorrow may bring. I want you to begin to do something different and seek help from someone who's been down that road and have helped other couples overcome the challenges that they've been through. So we provide support, we provide advice, we provide other couples who've been through those experiences who can be a support system to you. Come home to Couples Academy where you belong. So I hope that something that I, had, I said here today was helpful for you. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. We look forward to your questions. And if there's anything we can do, inbox us or contact us directly through our site. Talk to you guys. Hope you enjoyed tonight.